Welcome to Safety Talk. Personal safety expert Pete Canavan shares his insights and interviews experts who provide simple and effective tips, techniques, and technologies to keep you safe and secure both online and off. Here's Pete. Hello, and welcome to Safety Talk. I am your host and personal safety expert, Pete Canavan. I am joined by my colleague, branding and social media expert, Neil Haley. How's it going tonight, Neil? I'm doing fantastic, Pete. Again, uh, it doesn't feel like summer yet, but we're getting close. And uh, it's exciting that we're in the middle of almost the middle of May. It's, I can't believe it. And soon summer's time's coming. And uh, one of the comments before even you get into safety is the, the sad situation that's happening in our schools today, especially in 2019 with the number of school shootings uh, that came out on, I saw it on Facebook. The number is just astronomical for the short time of the year we're only halfway through the year and this many shootings we really have to figure this out it's it's become absolutely horrible it is uh staggering and you know our our guest tonight was going to be talking about how we can maybe sort of mitigate some of that and it is a sobering you know sort of topic and you know what we talk about on this show every week is something that is safety related it's going on in the news unfortunately seems like just about every week we have something in the news about another school shooting or a church shooting or something. Um, So today I wanted to focus on something a little bit different, which is just as equally important, which is your, uh, you know, something that's been recently in the news. And, you know, that is something that we basically thought was eradicated here in North America. And that is measles. It's like, okay, well, how does that really relate to safety? You know, what does it have to do with it? But really, you know, it has everything to do with it because if you don't take care of your health, it's going to make you more vulnerable uh, in many ways because you're going to be in a weakened state with regard to your health. And of course, uh, if you're unable to defend yourself, such as in some sort of physical attack or altercation or assault, uh, that's going to be detrimental to you. Uh, or if maybe you have to run to safety, so some sort of you know natural disaster or something that occurs, maybe a hurricane, tornado, flood, something that, that occurs, you know, if you're sick, you can't do what you, you can't perform at the normal level that you're used to, you know, that is a, is a problem. So when you're ill, your mind isn't as sharp, your muscles aren't as, as good as they, in shape that they should be or could be. So it's imperative that we do everything that we can to improve your overall you know, safety every single day. That includes taking care of your health, your body, spirit, and soul. So get your vaccinations, take care of your body, and, uh, and stay in shape as best you can because you've only got one body. And so you know, be sure to take care of that. So I just kind of want to talk about you know, mention that initially. Uh, that's so true. I mean, thinking about specifically enough it coming out again, if you're, you know, against, for or against the vaccine, just this situation that happened in Pittsburgh with the cases of measles, really, we have to kind of really caution ourselves before we jump to conclusions, especially when we're thinking about the overall health of an entire population, not just specific people based on specific thought processes of not wanting to be vaccinated. And and the danger of side effects for the vaccination versus uh, an epidemic are two different things, Pete. That's the biggest problem I see is that, you know, we got to think of the whole group, not just focus on one individual or a side effect if it's going to hurt everyone if they're not vaccinated. Right. And that's, you know, something that, you know, a lot of people think, you know, they, they can make these decisions and it's just, you know, it's like, you know, it's all about me. You know, this is what I believe. This is what I want to do. Well, okay. But unfortunately, sometimes you have to sacrifice some of that for the greater good. Now, uh, our guest today is someone who knows all about security, not just locally, but on a global scale. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in the homeland security and protection industry, and he manages sales and business development functions for a company called Metrisons. Now, if you're not familiar with them yet, you will be after this interview. Now, during our guest career, he noted that mass casualty attacks occur when targets are most vulnerable. This, of course, includes places like we've seen these attacks occurring with alarming frequency, such as churches, but of course, it also includes any other place like concert halls or schools and, you know, uh, stadiums and any other place where people tend to congregate. Now, his passion for wanting to work in a capacity to find ways to offer more protection in those places led him to Metrosyn's. And they are a global provider of advanced magnetic detection technologies, and they are developed to make these sort of places safer. So I'm pleased to have on the show today, Jim Viscardi, who is Vice President of Global Security at Metrosyns. Welcome to Safety Talk, Jim. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, Pete. Hi, Neil. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. 
Absolutely. So glad you're here because, you know, anything that can be done to improve safety is what we're all about here at Safety Talk. And we, of course, always seek out the new solutions and new technologies. And that's where, you know, your company comes in. Now, for those who may not be familiar with the company and what they do, essentially, you guys are a global provider of, you know, you're kind of putting out as advanced magnetic detection technologies. And those technologies can help, of course, make an impact on how various facilities can protect themselves from different attacks, right? Correct. Yeah, uh, that's right. Now, as an IT consultant, uh, I was looking at the website uh, before you know our, the interview today, and uh, the physical data security piece that Metrosyns has uh, really intrigued me. And that's that ProScreen uh, 500 product. Uh, and I guess this is something that you guys have developed that actually detects something like recording devices and also weapons. Could you kind of just, I just caught my eye. I wanted to ask you about that before we kind of dive into some of this other stuff. Absolutely. And I know you guys have hit on this in past podcasts, data protection, our own personal data protection, as well as the data that belongs to corporations, that's company sensitive, certainly the data that belongs to federal government agencies that's, that is security sensitive is we feel uh, uh, something that is very important. And it's a market where we feel customers just don't have the tools uh, that they need. Our goal is to prevent the Edward Snowdens of the world from walking into a classified area with a thumb drive at work and walking out with over a million classified documents, right? So traditional metal detection can't detect things like a thumb drive with any level of consistency and not at all if it's concealed inside the clothes and, you know, within the folds of the body or even inside the body. But that's what corporations need. They need a screening solution that can find data transmission or data storage devices anywhere on a person and do so without submitting employees to a taxing screening process. And that's really what the ProScreen 500 does. It's a, it's okay. a uh, portable, flexible system that can be deployed at a, at a SCIF setting, in a data center, anywhere where you know, data needs to be protected and do so uh, in a way that for quick deployment and, you know, uh, advanced uh, detection of those types of threats. Oh, wow. So is that an integration you're talking about? You do integrate with other devices as well with your technology? We can. The system can be used as a standalone use it, uh, unit. We see often that the system is integrated into a physical security information management system often that tends to happen uh, with more advanced corporations and federal agencies but uh, we've provided a system really that allows the end user to do whatever he or she wants to with it if they want to use it as a standalone system that is let's say at a cage inside of a data center they can do that if they want to use it as a fixed system that prohibits access to a classified area in a defense contractor's building uh, that works with access control and video systems, they can do that as well. That's interesting because I was wondering like, well, how does this one device, like I didn't kind of like get it. I was reading a little bit about it, but that makes sense where it'll actually be able to detect something. So if somebody's trying to even, uh, you know, get real sneaky, I mean, I've seen these uh, pens that have a USB drive. So it looks like a pen. You unplug the USB, you know, the end of the pen, it's a USB drive. You plug it in, you download your data, you plug it in, oh, it's just a pen. So it could actually detect something like that. There's all sorts of devices that we see out there. We see cell phones that are the size of your pinky finger uh, that you can buy on Amazon for $40. We see thumb drives that, our, uh, that are, are, are disguised to look like any number of innocuous items, phones that look like calculators and all sorts of things. And the crazy thing, really, Pete, is that you can buy these things online at a legitimate, you know, shopping portal like Amazon or eBay right. or any right. number of places. Exactly. They're readily, they're readily available, built to be uh, covert. And this is something that, uh, That's crazy. that yeah. federal agencies have to deal with every day. And not just those things, by the way, uh, wearable technology like Fitbits oh, wow. and Apple mm -hmm. Watches or something that are, are things that can be used for data storage, data transmission, or both just stuff that have that people have on them every day that they didn't have on them four or five years ago. Exactly. So yeah. the, the threat the threat has evolved for these types of facilities and what they need and now have is a technology that can evolve with those threats. See when you're uh, see this is very interesting 
can you give us an example of an end user using your system in a way to prevent something like this happening? We would never think this is happening, but then this could happen in many places where there's lots of sensitive material as, as kind of bring up the word espionage, right? In a certain way Absolutely. that so kind of given us that example, you know, we watch all these TV shows and stuff like this, but we've only heard about this kind of technology, like, okay, I'm just going to try to get some classified and um, not, cla um, you know, classified information from the government. And I'm going to go in and try to break in organizations like yourself are going to say, well, you know what, even though if you have the greatest technology in the world, we're going to catch you. We're so kind of give us like an example of how that works for an end user. Sure. So we have a uh, number of intelligence agencies uh, in Washington and beyond who use our equipment to do just what you're describing, to prevent really just what you're describing. And uh, they are using them in conjunction with things like access control to, um, to prevent uh, data storage and transmission devices from going into whether it's a room or a, the wing of a building or even an entire building where there's classified information housed, right? So uh, one in particular uh, uses the system in conjunction with uh, two things, uh, their video system and video analytics system that goes with and, as, and their, um, their, the mag locks on their doors. So our system essentially detects any kind of moving ferrous, i.e. magnetic, material that's moving within the detection zone of the unit, right? So you put it by the door, you walk by this thing, and if you can't clear this, in other, in other words, if it says, hey, there's something here that is ferrous material uh, that you shouldn't have, uh, it sends a trigger to the video system and the, and the video analytics system, so it immediately identifies through facial recognition who that person is, uh, identifies where they are in the building, and then triggers the mag locks on the door to prevent them from going through the door until that alarm can be resolved. Very cool. All while, all while being unmanned, right? So this isn't being done right at the point of screening. It's being monitored and controlled in a different room in a different building can be even in a different state the way that you know the, the physical systems are, are set up so uh so essentially the way systems, that it works yeah, is it reads the it reads the for people that that aren't real maybe understanding of how the technology works this this detector can detect the actual metallic signature of any metallic device that person's carrying whether it's a firearm or a knife or a usb drive correct Exactly. Very specifically, what we're detecting it is its magnetic signature. So the things that wow, yeah. uh, for, for data protection, uh, the, the key things we're looking for are things that are magnetic, steel, iron-based metals. It, with guns, it's obviously the steel. With cell phones, it's the antenna, it's the speaker, it's the, right. the, uh, the vibrating piece within the system. And when, that's, when, when you have uh, a system like ours that basically evaluates the Earth's magnetic field, which is naturally occurring, it's all around us, it penetrates everything, and you have something that has its own magnetic signature, like let's say a 22, and it moves to the detection zone of our system, essentially what's happening is the, our system is detecting the disturbance that that movement creates in the Earth's magnetic field. The easiest way I know how to say it is that it's it's very similar to a duck swimming across a still pond, okay? The faster that duck moves, or the bigger the duck is, the bigger the wake it creates. And our system, which is a passive system, it's not generating any waves or emitting any kind of interference, so it's intrinsically safe. Our system uh, detects that wake that that duck is creating. And because it can do that, it detects moving metals, uh, so it doesn't have to be a stationary system, uh, and it can detect those types of metals and thus those types of threats, not just under the clothes of people, even inside their bodies, through walls. Wow. It's just a very different yeah. technology. Now, I'm hearing this, so I'm saying you're talking about highly classified 
uh, if you're talking about, it can be used as a standalone system, but also integrated, but you're talking about big deployments with tons of security where you're integrating with a VMS access control and motion. I see this as something that would be a great product for schools because of, you know, the situation with, if there's a, a situation where somebody's trying to confiscate and bring in a, a gun or something into the school at region, have you worked with schools at all or colleges and universities and seeing that? We, you know, mm -hmm. we have worked with both. And so we provide a solution to schools that offers that level of screening that, uh, that they just don't, haven't had available to them. It's kind of similar to really any venue where there's, you know, kind of high footfall traffic and, and, and not it, it, what we would, it, it's what we would term a soft target, right? So uh, our system, which is called the ProScreen 900 Plus, screens students, it screens staff and visitors without having them and this is really important, change the way they walk into or around the school and without creating a security setup that resembles a prison, right? So that's a big factor in what we do with schools and universities. Students you can get out of the cars. People. You don't have to want that's, people. That's you have to sit there. And you, that takes a lot of time. That's exactly right. Students get out of their cars or off the bus or off their bike or whatever. They walk right into school. There's no divesting their backpacks. There's no stopping in line. They don't even have to slow down. If, however, if someone tries to enter that school with, let's, you know, let's say an AR-15, security officials can be notified immediately that there's a threat entering the school, and they can respond before the first shot is fired. And think about what that amount of time for a response personnel can mean. So it's a difference between life and death, really. Absolutely. Seconds count. We've seen that time and time again. That's a fantastic Absolutely. piece of technology. I'm glad I, I kind of focused in on it because I saw it on the website. So I read and I'm like, wow, this is really, really cool. And so it must be something that's fairly new. I would think this, how long has this been technology been out there? Well, the te the technology has been out for a while. It was actually pioneered by the founders of our company uh, okay. who, who started this, this company, who started the development of this technology, which we call ferromagnetic detection at Europe's largest R and D firm back in the, 90s uh in and so like every good tech company story uh the story of metrosense really starts in 2005 in the garage of one of our founders uh, his name is dr simon goodyear and so he and uh his partner dr Marquine, became aware of a new story uh in the u.s about uh, they were located in england uh about a six-year-old boy in new york who had died uh, inside of an MRI machine from the impact of a misplaced oxygen cylinder in the MRI suite. As we know, MRI wow. machines are just huge magnets, right? Yep. And so you need MRI safe oxygen cylinders and someone brought one in that wasn't. And, you know, there was a tragedy. At that time, though, virtually nothing was being done to screen patients or staff from bringing magnetic objects close to an MRI machine, but Dr. Keene, actually, who is the inventor of our products, based um, on the work he was doing for the MOD, knew he could take the technology he and Dr. Goodyear were working on and create an early warning system for MRI suites, and that's how Metrosense was born. Oh, and since wow. Then we've, yeah, but since then, we've really expanded into a number of vertical markets, and where the real growth is happening for us is in data protection, corrections, and in counterterrorism, which covers a number of sectors, including schools and stadiums and churches, like you said, uh, and a number, and really we focus on areas where either there's no security because traditional tools just don't fit, or where there is some security, but we can provide some enhanced security, meaning typically we can provide some level of early warning, like in schools. So that's kind of how this whole thing got started there in terms of developing that technology and unfortunately it took a tragedy but then you took this existing technology and was able to now you're kind of fine-tuning it into all these different different areas and unfortunately you know we're seeing a lot of need for it um so that's fantastic that that's you know what what the company's doing there improves that you know security and safety especially from places where you know there's a lot of soft targets around and they're milling about but in so many other ways, like, you know, in an MRI suite, because typically what do they do? They tell you, oh, take off all your metal before right. you come in here. 
exactly. right? There's nobody kind of spot checking you. I mean, you know, I haven't had an MRI in a while, but and the last time I had one, it was like, okay, just make sure you have no metal on you and then come on in. Well, if you forget, you know, you could have a problem, especially depending exactly. on what it is. So, uh, so why isn't your technology exactly. such so good? that uh, It is very good. I'm not saying that. Airports, why aren't we making it so that something, a product like yours can make things just go quicker through the airports and stuff like that with the ability to detect these things? Well, it's a, it's a great question. And I think the, uh, there are a number of workers out of work. <laughs> hey, too bad. Of very, you can say money. <laughs> hey, if they, if they if CSA can give, write a check right now, cut me a check for saying how we could save a lot of money. There you go. I don't know. <laughs> oh, so go on. <laughs> You're good. The, the, um, there are a number of variables to this, but what I will tell you is a couple things. First, Aviation security, and my background was in aviation security many years ago, um, is a relatively small but pretty well-funded uh, security sector uh, funded by, uh, you know, federal government, obviously DHS and TSA in the U.S. and other agencies around the world. So it's a pretty cluttered area in terms of security equipment and uh, and, and certainly they could benefit from advanced technologies like ours. However, we've made a conscious decision to focus on other areas. Really, our goal is to bring security to areas where security couldn't go before. So when you, when you look at our website, like Pete did, and you look at the sectors we're in, those are our security markets, security and safety markets, but I, would, I wouldn't call them traditional, right? They're not federal government buildings. They're not ports and borders. They're not airports. They're correctional facilities and they're behavioral health centers and, and hospitals, uh, uh, you know, physical data security applications like SCIFs and, you know, wherever, uh, and certainly counterterrorism markets like schools and churches and places for whom the the traditional tools weren't designed. Mm. So we've, so whereas the, the physical security industry, which is a very event driven reactive industry, as you guys know, has built screening tools for let's say aviation and then try to take those square pegs and fit them into school and church and stadium round holes. Uh, we are going the other direction. We're, we're choosing to start with those markets where we think security can have the biggest impact. Plus, I think build, as, by going into these non-invasive sort of places where, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for you to, you know, pat down somebody at a hospital or a school or whatnot because you have all kinds of issues. Now you have something that's a non-invasive way of screening people, whereas you don't have to go and compete with uh, necessarily directly with a solution that's already in place. They're already doing screening, you know, like at the airports. They're doing it differently, but they're doing it, and they're doing it in a pretty effective manner, and so that's great. So I think that's smart that you, you're focusing on some places where, like corrections, you know, you got a guy walking into uh, a prison, you know, well, now he just has to walk past the scanner to make sure he doesn't have something in his body, you know, that's metallic, you know, trying to sneak yeah. whatever. Absolutely, and and corrections is a is a is a very strong market for us, and it's not because we've built another quotes airport style like detection system. It's because we've built a system that they don't use at the front door. By the way, most of the contraband that's in a prison doesn't come through the front door. It comes in through staff. It comes in through the kitchen and commissary vendors. It comes in through being tossed over the fence. Drones are a huge problem in prisons now because people are flying drones over the yard, dropping contraband into the yard, and that's how it gets in. Wow. So if 85% of your contraband doesn't come in the front door, then what do you need another detector at the front door for? What you need is a detection system that you can take behind the wall, if you will, and use to find contraband that is being hidden within the prison. And that's what, that's from a security perspective, that's where we kind of got our start on the security side. And we've taken that model and kind of duplicated it in behavioral health and physical data security and even counterterrorism. We build portable detection systems that people can deploy very quickly and very cost effectively and in a way that makes sure that it fits their operational needs. And that's a big part of what we do, guys. We design products, security products that fit 
both the operational and the call it architectural uh, uh, sort of the function and the and the design and all of that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's the word I'm looking for. Right. It, it, it fits. In other words, if if you have to change the way your business, your facility, or whatever operates or looks to accommodate what we're trying to deploy, then we've not done our job right. Uh, the, the security solutions moving forward in the world are going to be ubiquitous. They're going to be all around us. We're not going to see them. Okay, right. it's going to be we're going to have ton, tons of sensors integrated into all sorts of other sensors and, and integration systems, and you won't know they're there, but you'll be screened as you're walking through the course of your normal day, walking into a stadium, walking into a concert hall, walking into school, and you won't and even so, know it. So that's and the big thing here know. with with what you've got is that, you know, we've got all these different types of technologies and metal detectors where, you know, you got to walk through the, you know, the metal detector or like, you know, in the airport, you got to walk through and you put your hands up while the thing zips around you or, you know, you go into a concert or something and somebody's got to, you got to put your hands up, hold your metal in your pockets or throw it in a, you know, in a, in a basket while they wand you to make sure you're not sneaking something in. So that's where. I think it's really neat where it says something like you can hide this thing behind walls, you can mount it on walls. And so I think as we see more of this, you know, type of screening technology in place, um, is it that I want to, I want to talk a little bit about your take on sort of the, are we getting lulled into a false sense of security when we see more security things or do we feel more secure uh, if we don't see them? In, in knowing that they're just being working, but then does that also maybe cause us to feel not safe because we don't know if it's working because we're not seeing a physical beep going off from a metal wand or, you know, the thing being triggered when somebody walks through it. Like what, I, I think that's an interesting sort of dynamic to look at with, with a technology that becomes more passive versus something that's, that everybody's used to as being more, more active and more invasive. I think that's a fantastic question. And I will tell you that it depends on the sector that uh, in which you're deploying security, right? So you see stadiums where they've got dozens of security people stationed all over the place. And when you go through, uh, you know, the, the, this bank of walkthrough metal detectors and or handheld metal detectors that they're using to screen people, you think, okay, I'm going to walk up to that line and everyone who walks up that line, all 80,000 of us are going to walk through it and be screened <laughs> and we'll walk through the other side with this clean bill of security health. Not and true. depending on who you ask, that may or may not be true. Uh, certainly security companies and facilities who implement these types of things uh, like the deterrent factor, but the deterrent factor is only good until something happens. Now, when we talk about, and again, we're talking about this technology, uh, where do you see, what other technology do you provide? And we talked about with this, with the involving detecting things, like different ways that end users can utilize this technology that are provided here at Metricence. Um, what else do we provide? Well, this, yes. this is this is primarily what we provide. But what we're finding happening more and more is is the desire by our customers to use this system in conjunction with other technologies that are complementary and provide for a more comprehensive screening solution. Right. So I've mentioned video a lot. I've mentioned access control a lot. Uh, physical barrier security, intrusion detection, those kinds of things where. I can detect a weapon at 100 yards from my facility, and all of a sudden I put up barriers, for example, that uh, won't allow uh, a vehicle to, to enter my facility until that alarm is resolved. Or can detect intrusion on, on a fence line uh, where we've put sensors and uh, that have detected at a distance uh, from the facility some kind of threat, and then that coupled with the intrusion detect detector acts as orthogonal detection that says, okay, you really have something here. So uh, those are the kinds of things that, that we're seeing. Uh, what we are seeing a lot more of now are, are really two things. One is data and data collection and the use of a system like ours in conjunction with others to collect the data uh, that, has, uh, that arises from screening hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people a day in some of the facilities we serve. 
um, and artificial intelligence. That is not common in um, in uh, the physical security world yet, but it's coming. And it and it and, and especially with we see it a little bit now with smart video, uh, but smart video gives you you know one piece of the puzzle, and is often kind of uh, af an after event tool. Uh, we can we can use AI uh, to more effectively um, provide screening that further enhances not only our detection capabilities but also says, okay, this person has, for example, this typical magnetic signature. They walk into our building every day and we've kind of created they we've kind of created a personalized magnetic signature for this person. Now he comes in next week and his magnetic signature is much, much larger. Well, we're not interested in detecting the things that he has on that we don't care about, like his laptop and his phone. That's fine. But now he's got something in addition to those that are much, much bigger and that presents a challenge. So uh you, you can't do that with one system alone. We're, we, we certainly endorse the layered security approach in physical security, really any kind of security. Uh, but this can definitely, uh, this can, can significantly enhance the, the physical security in place and the barriers and the physical deterrence uh, in a big, big way. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a really the, cool thing. That's technique. right. It's the trigger. It's the trigger that these systems have needed to say, hey, there's something wrong here that goes beyond being triggered by a person. It's now triggered by an actual threat. And that's a big difference. So what do you see as some of the challenges that, uh, that you're facing or that maybe people that are interested in implementing something like these solutions um, and how you know, they get it to work for their particular sort of environment? Are you, are you coming up with any sort of resistance or people saying, no, I don't want to implement this because of X? Well, because it's like another okay, layer. So people are like, you yeah, know, I, I already yeah. do this. I already do this. Why do I need this? So you'd think the biggest challenge is cost, but it's but it's really not. The, probably the most difficult challenge we come up against is kind of changing that old guard security mindset where they use tools that they've had for 30 years. We use hand wands and that's what we use because that's what we always use and that's what we train our people on. Right. And that's what we use. And I can't blame them. Those are the tools that they've been given. But now they start to see companies like ours bringing, you know, our solutions to the table. And they, what they're realizing now is they're bringing a sword to a gunfight. And they need to have these 21st century solutions to deal with 21st century threats because hand wands ain't getting it done. And it's the willingness to change uh, that is Again, the biggest challenge, you know, the, the physical security industry, as I said before, it's an, it's an event driven, reactive system uh, or uh, industry that has a real paradox. They, they want to provide a high level of security screening, but they don't want to do it at a very high cost. So they'll put, you know, lots and lots of guards around, but they won't pay them very much, for example. And that's, correct, it's, yeah. and that's, that's, that's a challenge for them. And it's a challenge for the people who then visit that facility. We uh, think that you don't necessarily have to compromise in order to really uh, to, to provide the, you know, the level of screen that you need to be able to provide. This is it comes an industry down to like education. To, it's like everything and, else. You got to educate them on ed it. Education and, in, and embracing technology. That's what the physical security industry really needs to start doing. And, and we've seen it. It's yes, happening. And it's, it's happening. happening it's happening on the surveillance side, no doubt. And now in terms of the screening and detection side, it, that's coming behind, but it's coming. And it's really companies like ours, frankly, that, that are leading the way. When you mentioned the other things like facial recognition, license plate recognition, some of this other great technology, that's why it's so cool about the ability for you guys to integrate your solution with theirs. So that it really makes it so it's very, very difficult to not be caught in with a specific violence or something else that happens or disturbance that happens at your facility with all of these measures in place. Absolutely. You need, you need more pieces of the puzzle and that's what we're providing. We're providing another essential piece of the puzzle. So that whoever is at the other end of that security system that's doing the screening can make a better decision faster. That's it. And that's, 
the name of the game when you're trying to, you know, either move people through a checkpoint or when you're trying to make a determination on to, you know, whether or not something's a problem, you got to know quickly. And technology is the best way to do that because you're using the power of that technology. I had somebody on the podcast just recently talking about AI. And, you know, you, you briefly mentioned, you know, how artificial, artificial intelligence is changing the landscape in a lot of ways. And as it's being integrated into all these other technologies, like facial recognition and camera systems and gate recognition, how people walk. I mean, at IC West last month, we saw some of that stuff and it was amazing to see how AI is getting into a lot of these technologies and just how a lot of these various uh, systems now are trying to integrate with each other because to, sort of to have that full approach of how do we cover all of our bases and how do we do it with the minimal amount of uh, of interfaces, <laughs> quite frankly, you know, I want to be able to manage all it is from sort of, you know, one command center with everything in it, but not have to use, you know, six different software programs to track this for one and this for another. And I get alerts popping up here and there. And, you know, so the integration side of it, I think, is, is, is slowly but surely starting to meld uh, together and become closer and closer. And the sort of the willingness for the various technology companies to work together because, you know, everybody's looking at the end of the day, like how do we keep people safer and things more secure? All have a very similar mindset. And it's very, very interesting. And it's something I've, I haven't seen in other industries where it's like, it's my customer. No, it's your customer. No, it's our customer. How can we help the customer? I think that's really true. I think that's really true. And um, uh, people who have been in this industry, and I've been in 20 years, and sometimes I feel like I'm a still a newbie compared to, some of the people uh, with whom we work. Um, just security is one of those industries where people in it because they love it. You know, uh, right. I, I've, I've been doing it for 20 plus years uh, because I, I love what we do. I, I, I love, you know, contributing in some way to creating a safer world. And in fact, prior to my working in MetroSense, I worked at a company that developed more traditional screen tools and was the biggest of its kind and still is, and it's a great company. Um, I left there to come here uh, because I saw what they were doing with their technology and they and, and, and knew that they could take the screening industry where it wanted to go. And it, it, it wants to go away from that checkpoint modality and, and towards more ubiquitous screening, as I mentioned before. And... Well, you're trying to change the anybody. paradigm, right? You're trying to change how things are done. And that's a big undertaking. You have, to, <laughs> you, ha you have to, because that's what terrorists are doing. Because five years ago, terrorists weren't bombing nightclubs in Florida. Ten years ago, terrorists weren't, you know, going after convention centers in California. The, the threat has changed. Yep. And so the paradigm needs to change with it. And that, and that's where MetroSense wants to take it. Definitely, for sure. Well, I mean, as looking at the specifics of the technology and the process, do you feel? What do you think of your prod product with usability? What do you think, especially when you're talking about specific end users that don't have, you know, the experience in this industry? They are still an old school mentality about how to protect people. How easy is your for for your technology to be implemented? Well, yeah, you, you, you hit it right in the head. It has to be easy to use. Our system, for example, has three buttons on it. One of them's on off, and the other one's volume. <laughs> so, how how hard could the system be, right? No, that's uh, you have to make I, it, I need you to train me. That's a little too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Uh, it has to be flexible. So I, I have to be able to use it where I want to use it and not be forced to use it in a certain area. And it has to be, it has to make sense. It has to provide a result, okay, that makes sense. It's, and our system is very simple. It's either green, there's nothing there, or red, uh, there's a threat there that you want to pay attention to. Keep in mind that the markets we serve, MRI safety, behavioral health, these are markets where we're, we're providing this equipment to, in most cases, to non-security personnel. The, sec the director of security in a behavioral health facility is typically the nurse who's been there longer than anybody else. Right. So we have to provide her or him with a system that is so easy to use. That's why I think a lot of, you know, industries have migrated towards hand wands in the past because they're just so simple to use and they're cheap. 
and you just kind of wave them and you know we can all go into stories about how we've seen people use hand wands in a very ineffective way so let's take the onus off the end user to use the system properly and just give them a system that works. You put it down, you turn it on, it comes ready in five seconds and it's ready to go. And the system doesn't lie and they can rely on the result they're seeing and that helps them make a better security decision. That's um, where we've had to focus and it's really helped us when we've gotten then into more security related uh, markets like counterterrorism and data protection because um, now we're now we're, we've kind of started from scratch and we've said okay this is what we would provide to somebody who doesn't have a security background when somebody who does sees that and they say okay great now i want to take it here and we can easily go along with it so what is the future of this technology what do you see as uh sort of the next step or the next how this is going to evolve well i think we're going to continue to bring the technology to you know again a number of markets where security screening isn't either isn't done because the traditional tools don't work or where we can enhance it. And like, you know, schools is a great example of that. But of course, um, lighter, smaller, cheaper is of course what we want. Uh, listen, there's nothing that says that this type of technology can't be used on a residential level. You know, we put cameras on our doorknobs now. Right. Why can't we have detection systems that warn somebody if someone's approaching their house with a weapon? Sure. It that's, makes perfect sense, that, especially if the cost is the down. Yeah, that's the level on which we're we're thinking here in Metrosense. Yeah, and this thing only weighs 20 pounds. You could put it anywhere. You probably want to bolt it down so it steals it on you. But. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, building that into I mean, I could even see going, you know, towards, you know, the next generation of smart homes where everything is being built in now with internet access and all the smart appliances and everything, something like this makes it even a logical next step as well, where you can put one of these things, you know, at the front door, the back door, you know, uh, and somewhere maybe in the, in the main part of the house. I mean, what is the, and there's a, there's a question for you. What is the range of like a single one of these units? Like what, what area could it cover? Could it cover one cover a typical home, like 2000 square feet or, these are point sensors, so the the detection is happening within a five foot radius, typically of the of the system. Okay, so um, the door is but good. The, but but the, but the door is good. But even more important than that, I can put it farther down the the sidewalk or farther down the driveway. It doesn't have to be at the front door. It can be, uh, but it can. But with our technology, it can be anywhere. I can put it anywhere. I can stick it in a bunch of trees and detect cars as they're coming down the driveway, and do all sorts of types of things like that. Um, that's really that's because it does say it could be put behind concrete or drywall or cinder block or metal studs and it'll still work. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. That's so, a heck of a product. It, so it has to be hidden in some, so that people don't know that this detection is there, right? Well, it could be. Well, it can be. Um, it, 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 it doesn't have to be. And some people like it as a deterrent, but most people like our system because of the form factor it can be easily blended into what's around. It's not this imposing portal or a guard who's holding a wand. It can be built into, you know, the facades and office buildings and things like that and, uh, and used to screen people, uh, again, either in, a, in an overt fashion or a covert fashion. So they don't know that, the, that, it, the, that they're being screened. Um, so what do people think of your technology? Let's, let's find out. So, so we think it's cool, and I'm sure you do. <laughs> what, what do the customers think? What do the people that are experiencing it uh, think when they, when they start to you know, use this? Our customers love our technology, and the, the, the analogy that I use is uh, I once heard someone say, it's only a problem if you have a solution. So – we provide solutions to a lot of problems that facilities like behavioral health facilities or correctional facilities um, have, but didn't have an answer for. So they just made the decision, you know what, we're not going to deal with that. You know, the contraband issue in corrections, for example, it's terrible. It's, uh, cell phones are, are, have been very prevalent in, in uh, prisons for a long time, and there really wasn't a good way to combat it. And then we came along and took you know, 80% of the market uh, because we, because they finally, 
saw something uh, that could that could actually solve the problem. One of the um, secretaries of corrections in the states that we're that we're in, and we're in 40 or 50 states around the U.S. Once said to me, he said, "You know, I didn't know I needed one of these things until until I got it." That's and, awesome. Uh, and for us, that's that's the biggest compliment. Yeah, because once they see how it works, and it's actually like, "Wow, I didn't realize this thing was." able to, to do what I, what I'm seeing it do. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, keeping them safe, you know, keeping things out that aren't supposed to be getting in. That's huge. Now, absolutely. People always have some reservations about any sort of screening, right? Uh, it doesn't matter how passive you tell them, right? And, I, and one of the things, you know, it says on the, on the spec sheet here for the product is it's, you know, it's safe for anybody who's got like a surgical implant or, you know, people who are pregnant because that's always a big problem, you know, that you run into with like the hand wands or the other things. People are like, oh, wait a minute, I got a pacemaper. I can't go through that. It's like, no, it's okay. No, 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 no. I don't yeah. want it. You know, and they, they freak out. So um, right. how, not just for the people that maybe have like an implant or something like that, but how as, I guess overall, how do people get, comfortable with yet another sort of screening device, you know, when it, when they see it, I mean, if they don't see it, they don't know about it. Okay. No harm done. They don't see anything, but when they have something like this, it, you know, to somebody, I mean, it looks pretty, you know, <laughs> innocuous, right. But the somebody's gonna be like, who that's intimidating. I don't want to go near that. I don't want those, those waves going through my body. So how do we, how do we get people more comfortable with, with, I guess that part of, of, uh, you know, of screening overall? Well, I, it's a great question. In my experience, people generally get annoyed with any kind of screening, right? It's it's a necessary evil. It's an inconvenience. Um, and what's even more annoying is when they can see a screening operation and it's inefficient. So it's even slower than they think it needs to be. Our systems, and when you think about a system like the ProScreen 900 Plus, which we use at stadiums and schools and places with, with uh, high throughput, uh, our system accelerates the screening process, not decelerates. So whereas, as a frame of reference, the typical throughput per hour at an airport is 420 people, right? That's kind of what they shoot for. Uh, with our system, we are moving 3,000 to 3,500 people through. That's unreal. Like That's unreal. Hours. Yeah. So you really can talk about inefficiency at airports then. With their no time. doubt. And, and, so, and so how do people get used to it? They experience it and they go, wow, that's a lot easier than what I used to have to go through or what I've gone through at other facilities. And all of a sudden screening doesn't become this big, obtrusive, uh, uh, tenuous Passive. process. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, exactly, it is just something that I can just walk through and it's done and I'm good. And I bet what else what is interesting are. too is like, I know like with, uh, for example, with like a hand scanner, right? I mean, I've done event security. I've used those things. Yeah. It's funny when you see people start to come in the door and then they see the scanning going on and they turn around and they walk out <laughs> because they know <laughs> They're, whatever they're carrying, whether it's a concealed weapon, you know, a gun, a knife, or something they shouldn't be carrying in there, they see that, and so it has that deterrent. So I can see sort of two sides of this, right? You can have the actual deterrent where somebody is seeing it in action, right? Uh-oh, I, I have something. I see other people being checked for what I'm trying to sneak in. I'm going to get caught if I don't turn around and leave kind of thing, right? Then you have the other side Absolutely. of it, which is – you've got this device completely maybe inside of a wall or, you know, bolted to a wall or something like that. So it's kind of out of the way. You don't see it. And now everybody's kind of just walking through. Everything's going on. You've got something you think, oh, man, I'm, it's going to be easy for me to sneak in this. And then all of a sudden, eh, you're, you're, you're caught, right? Or, or an alarm goes off and now you're like, oh, wow, what the heck's going on? And security descends on you, et cetera. So, it's interesting, I think, to look at it from both sides, you know, like the, the actual seeing the deterrence occurring versus not seeing anything until there's an issue. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so we've divined, divide, uh, designed, I should say, a system that can be used as for both overt and covert screening. So it's really up to the end user then to decide what to, you know, they want to subject their their 
you know, their patrons too, uh, and what's going to be most effective. And I'll add a third piece to that. The third piece is now we're using a different technology which detects threats in a different way. And the best way to explain that is an example that we had at a correctional facility in California. Uh, there, we had an inmate who uh, was being screened using our product, and he kept setting it off. And they, he, they, he takes stuff out of his pockets, and he kept setting it off, and kept setting it off, and they eventually had him down to his, you know, boxers and uh, flip flops, and he kept setting it off. And they said, "All right, you got something on you. The system doesn't lie. This is our Cell Sense Plus unit." And uh, they finally took him down to uh, medical imaging, and they found that he had two security drill bits in his stomach. Ugh. And so they asked him, they said, what would you do that for? And he said, well, I saw you come in, and I just popped them in my mouth. And secu- all the screws in, in correctional facilities have secu- you know, security heads so that you need a special drill bit to unscrew them. Well, he right. had two of these things. And he said, I just popped them in my mouth because when you guys screen me with, you know, with, with your hand wand, it never gets it. <laughs> um, so whether, whether they can see it or not is, is a big factor, but now we're detecting different things in different ways. So now that person walks in and says, well, maybe they're screening there, but I can usually get this gun through if I hide it in my coat or if I hide it in my belt or if I put it in my sock. Right. Uh, and, and, and I can, I can still get through a security checkpoint. You can't now, uh, with a system like ours. So and that's, so, yeah, that's great. That's a big piece yeah. of it. Yeah. I think that's, that's, I think that's fantastic. So you talked about how certain people got it, right? They, they're already using their own methods, airports, things like that. Do you see, see your technology at one point getting to airports to make it more efficient? Do you think it will happen? At I one think. Point? I, I think I think it can. Um, I think the uh, another interesting question about airports is where else can we do screening where there currently is none? the The airside part of the airport is really pretty secure, right? And we've screened every passenger and staff member uh, who's going into the airside of the airport. But um, anyone can walk into the ticket lobby. Anyone can walk into baggage claim, right? And so, and there have been attacks recently. The most recent one I can think of is in was in Belgium, mm-hmm. uh, where where bombs were just thrown into the into the uh, baggage claim area. There's no security being done there. And so, what if we aren't just creating efficiencies at the checkpoint for passengers and staff, uh, but what if we can also provide a system that hardens the other parts of the airport? Uh, which actually tend to be some of the more crowded parts of the airport uh, and and do so in a way that um, doesn't require checkpoint the same checkpoint that's at the that's at in the terminal to be used at the baggage claim area for visitors and people picking up other passengers and taxi drivers and stuff like that. What if we can harden that? So our interest in airports really um, we have uh, obviously interest in in aviation security, but in airport security itself, I think that's an interesting question that we're asking ourselves now. What can we do to help make that airport, not just air travel, safer? Right. No, hey, it, and there, like you said, there. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of people in those areas and they aren't screened the same way. You can walk in there with anything until you get, you know, to that final, you know, get into your gate area. So that's uh, that's interesting. We could use it on the on the perimeter, et cetera. So very very neat stuff, Jim. We really appreciate you being on here. You have any last thoughts for our listeners here? We, we're cranking right through our hour here. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate your time. I think this is a really important topic to talk about safety in general, and certainly physical um, security specifically. And uh, I just uh, I, I think that you know. Companies like ours are striving to do what needs to be done in security, which is not just to make detection uh, uh, more capable and keep facilities safer, but do it in a way that so that it can be woven into the fabric of society so that we can screen people as they live and work and travel um, and not make those people uh, or I should say subject those people to 
you know, an arduous screening paradigm. That's yeah, take out there. Take off your shoes uh, at the airport. Here we go. <laughs> right. Exactly. People, people are doing it. Companies like Metrosense are doing it. And, uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing other companies start to get on board. That's awesome. So if people are interested in learning more about uh, Metrosins and the, the process and the technology, uh, the website, obviously, uh, just the company name, right? Metrosins.com? Yep. www.metrosins.com. That's M-E-T as in Thomas, R-A, S as in Sierra, E and as in November, S as in Sierra, Metrosins.com. And of course, you guys are on social yeah. media too, right? LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Absolutely. All that. all that good stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, hey, thanks so much for being on uh, Safety Talk, Jim. Really appreciate it. Any last uh, thoughts, Neil? Nope. Okay. <laughs> I was getting ready to close. No, I have my, uh, my thoughts. This is very informative. Very, very good. Uh, I really enjoy learning about certain technology like this and just it just blows you away what we can do to protect people. And yet the areas where these terrible, horrific attacks are happening do not have the kind of technology in those areas. And that's that why need. that they need truly. If you look at a lot of these different places that where there, the attacks have occurred, they're, they're close sometimes security wise, but not to the level that they need to be to stay secure. No. And I think we're going to see this, this product a lot more places, Jim, uh, if you have anything to say about it, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks again for being on, and uh, thanks to our listeners for tuning in to Ta Safety Talk. Of course, you can always get more information about uh, the products uh, that we talk about on the show at safetytalkproducts.com. And, of course, past episodes as well as safety news and information uh, in between our episodes at safetytalkpodcast.com. I'm your host, Pete Canavan, and until our next show, you guys all stay safe. <laughs>